Amen. I just had a thought a while ago, and I'm going to ask y'all a couple of questions. You can call this a test, but it's not a test. You don't have, I don't want anybody to answer these questions. These are rhetorical questions. You can write them down, or you can just think what your answer would be in your own mind. But this will, the first question is going to go back into Romans chapter 9. And here's my question. Can you give me two reasons why it's futile for believers to try to impress God or to get on his good side by keeping the law? I'll say it one more time. I don't know if I can say it the same, but in other words, why is it that so many people think that we have to obey the law in order to be acceptable to God? There's there's more than two, but I'll take two in any of the any of them. So I'll give you just a moment to think about that one. Y'all have it by now? Okay. The first one is we can't keep the law, so it's futile to begin with. And the second reason is because it's doing it on our own effort. We're not depending on the Lord, we're playing on our effort in trying to keep the law. Furthermore, we're dead to sin. Furthermore, our old man has been crucified with Christ. And another reason is because we're not under the law. While we're in the question mode here, I'm going to ask you about what we covered Tuesday night. And we acknowledge that the sufferings that we face in the here and now, we can feel the pain. We can experience it as being real. But there is a payoff for this that is in the future. So my question is, what two things mitigate our suffering? In other words, there's two things as believers, and this is referring to believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. There are two things that make our suffering tolerable. And when we think about these things, then we are able to think about the things that are coming that are much more important than our sufferings. Two things. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. I'll just tell you. But you can put in your own mind that you check the, the box or not. The first thing when it comes to sin, you don't want to just may a marinade in your sin. You don't want to think about, I mean, excuse me, your suffering. You don't want to think about your suffering. You don't have to because that brings you down. The first thing that mitigates our suffering is that it's temporary. This too shall pass. And so temporary can mean a little short time or it can be a longer time, but it's still just for a season. And the other one, anybody remember what the other one is? You do? Okay, let's hear it. There you go. Now, you want to get a bonus point on that? Okay. Does anybody want a bonus point? The bonus point is still knowing where that is. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Right? So, these are things that we, when we're suffering, we can think about the fact this is just temporary. And the other fact is in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we have a promise from God. And this, by the way, this is only for believers who are in the spiritual mode when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 essentially says you're not being tested in a way that is foreign to what other people have been tested. And that the Lord is going to make a way of you to to bear that suffering. And, and that's a promise that he gives to us. Now, he doesn't take us away, uh, make a uh, 
what they call those when you're on a road, a detour. He doesn't detour around the suffering. He takes us right through it. And when you're going right through it, what you're going to be noticing is the first thing that you're going to notice is his faithfulness and his power and his love and so many other things. We don't really want to get into rigorous testing, but that's when we're closest to the Lord. And so those are the two things that mitigate our suffering. And if we can think of that, okay, I'm not going to feel like this forever. I'm not going to be in this situation forever. And God promises me that if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, well, let's just look at it. Turn your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you don't have it underlined, this would be a good time to do that. This is a great promise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now your translation will probably say, no temptation has overtaken you, but I gave you last time in the BDAG lexicon, a Greek, essentially a Greek dictionary, the first definition is testing. I don't know why they put temptation here, but anyway. No testing has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. You're not, you're not suffering in a special way. Everybody has suffered this way. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able, but with the testing will provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Usually what's the first indication that you're failing on the testing test? Huh? Yeah, well, you're... There you go. Yours were true. That's, those are in there. But number one on the hit parade is worry. And how much fun can you have when you're worried? How much can you enjoy life being worried? Because those are the two things. So I'm going to put this on the board where we ended last time. And this is what I was asking you about. And I'm going to do that as soon as I can find my Here it is. Okay. It's true that the glory is yet future and it is not yet felt while our present sufferings are felt now. So we need to put our sufferings which are temporary and can be mitigated by God by 1 Corinthians 10.13. That's a promise you can, you can embrace. Into perspective. Put our sufferings into perspective by recalling these two things. And then... <clears throat> We, we can have the right perspective with the colossal glory that is available to us, which will be felt throughout all eternity. So you're going to feel the suffering here on earth just for a small time, but it is going to redound to having colossal glory that is felt through all eternity. During this, we'll encourage you to stay the course even while under rigorous testing. I went in more detail last time, but we're just reviewing here. And then, so we must be on guard not to allow our temporary suffering to blind us to a thousand eternal joys. We need to stop focusing and being defeated with worry because of the temporary suffering we are experiencing. The more we focus on rewards, privileges, opportunities, and glory that lie ahead, the less prone we are to succumb to middle attitude sins that bring us down and make life miserable. And now we can start our lesson for tonight. This is lesson 20, no, this should be 27, no, 26. No, today's the 27, there you go. Okay. Adele, uh, you have lesson 226? Okay, we're good to go. 227? 
Oh, yeah, I'm not at the right place. So that was 225. This was already 226. Okay. But I'm not going to spend much time in this one. You no, know, we haven't seen this one, I know. Well, forget about all the lesson numbers there and just let's look at what we got. The only we can, way we can keep that from happening, and that is allowing middle attitude sins to uh, control us, is to maintain our spiritual strength by consistent, consistently learning Bible doctrine with a focus on the wonderful things that God has waiting for those who endure to the end. We must endure to the, the end of what? Hmm? Our life, right? Okay, now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Hebrews is way back there. Hebrews 10, 32. Hebrews 10.32 starts out, But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a pub public spectacle through the reproaches and tribulations, and partly because, because uh, by becoming shares with those who were so treated. So we're talking about very serious and rigorous persecution here, even torture. Verse 34, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession and abiding one. What is that talking about? It's not talking about a possession here on earth, is it? They had their property seized and they took it with right in step because they knew they were going to have another one and an abiding one soon. And that goes for us as well. It would be when, when Christ went to prepare a place for us. He's talking about our heavenly home. Verse 35. Therefore do not throw away your conscience which has a great reward. Whenever you lose your conscience not in yourselves, but about God and His Word, you're in big trouble. And so the way you keep your confidence is to stay ready by staying up with the study of God's Word. Verse 36, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while. Now you need to underline that. We think about how many days I talked about Keith Twiggs a while ago. He's 99. We'll be in next month. And he'll be the first to tell you how fast life goes by. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous ones shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Remember I said that is a litotes. It takes a negative to really accentuate what kind of trouble you are when you shrink back from where we should be. Some, some denominations call it backsliding. Verse 39. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Okay, let me see where we... And I think I'll pick it up here. Psalm 16, went out the verse above it, or rather the sentence above it. 
As to the wicked, God will turn their glory into shame. There's a lot of wicked people out there that are glorifying themselves, doing anything they want to do, no restraints, and they're proud of the fact that they don't have to answer to God. What are they? Fools. So as to the wicked, God will turn their glory into shame, but as to the godly, He will turn their shame into glory. You stand for Christ, especially in the environment that we have today, and you're going to suffer. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be cursed. Even maybe physically attacked. Hebrews 11, 24 through 27. Did we go over that last time? We did, didn't we? Okay, we're going to read. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews eleven twenty four. The next, the next chapter here. And this is talking about Moses, so we're hitting, we're killing two birds with a stone because we're studying, of course, Moses in Exodus. Verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach. Now reproach here means undeserved suffering. He suffered undeserved suffering on the, for the cause of Christ because he is going to throw in with God's people, the Hebrews. Conf <coughs> considering that the reproach, which again is... Uh, the type of, <clears throat> excuse me, undeserved suffering of, uh, for Christ, he, he just determined that those were greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. I have that under, underlined. How many of you know people who have gone to church their whole entire lives and they don't even know that there are rewards available to them? They're, they're everywhere, and yet this is what was a motivating force for Moses, and it should be for us as well. Verse 27, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. We just studied something in the last week or two, and it's P-S-E-D. Personal sense of eternal destiny. Won't you write those letters there? Because that's exactly what he's doing. The Bible says, as seeing him who is unseen. And the way you do that is through a personal sense of eternal destiny. We're going to see Jesus Christ someday. And the more that we think about him, learn about him, and become more like him, the greater the experience of eternity is going to be for us. It takes endurance, and one way you endure is by seeing him who is cannot be seen. How do we see him? Can y'all look up here and see this? This is how we see him through his word. Verse twenty eight by faith he kept he kept the Passover. Well, no, I just went to 27. Okay. That's good. Now, if you look up here, this is a quote about what we just read there. He, he says, uh, this is, by the way, Joseph Exel, the biblical illustrator of Romans, volume 2, and he says this. In Hebrews 11, verses 25 through 26, there is a similar course of reasoning which he was talking about. Now, you have to really pay attention to this because I have to explain a few things and it's not going to sound like it's making much sense the first time, the first go round. He says, see how he loads the scales. Now, he's talking about what we just read about Moses. He says, on the world side, pleasures and treasures. I'll give you a quick peek at the kind of scales we're talking about. You'll see these in a minute. See them? Old timey scales. And so when it says, see how, see how he loads the scales, on the world side, he's loading up 
pleasures and treasures. Let's say that's the scale on this side. On Christ's side, over here, he's putting in the scale here, reproaches and afflictions. Okay? Then he says, but with the former, talking about the world side over here where you have pleasures and treasures, he throws in for a season. Now what this means is, he's going to hook up with these people who are in it for temporary life. And he says, and it's for a season, because this life only lasts so long and then it ends, doesn't it? So when he says, but with the farmer, the farmer is loading the scales on the world side with pleasures and treasures. And that just lasts for a season. But with the latter, which is with the people of Christ who are loading their side with reproaches and afflictions, he says, with the latter cast in with the people of God, and in a moment, in other words, as soon as these things are loaded, he says the world kicks the beam. Now, I don't think any of you knew it. I know, knows what this means. But I looked it up, and here's what it means. When he says the, the world kicks the beam, he says, kick the beam to rise as lighter scale of balance so as to strike against the beam, hence to be of little weight or of or importance. So I have a little diagram here to help you see what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a regular scale here. Have you, ever, have you ever used one of these, any of you? Well, they're accurate. They're good. Now, here's what... This, this scale is kicking the beam. You know, see how these are even right here? But this one, the one on the left, or let's see, that would be on your right, temporary pleasures and treasures. That's what the first ones were doing. That's what they were living for. Pleasures and treasures. That's worldly. And then you see the one that's down is eternal joy, rewards, and pleasures. And what this means is this one is more, what we saw up here, is, is more important and it's something that, that's what we desire for that side of our scales to go down. But the one thing I want you to look that makes all the difference between these, you see this word here? Temporary. You see this word here? Eternal. That's one reason this goes down so so far. And this when when this one goes up, it says it kicks the beam. I guess this one hits the other side or whatever it is. So I started not to use this because I had to figure out what it was first. We're kicking the beam. But this is what we want our scales to look like. And the way that they're going to look like that is by how you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you are able to... Focus on things that are important. The important things are the invisible things. We learned that just the other day. And that's how we get that weight, the, the scale to go down, and that's what's most important in our life. I don't know if it was worth all my time and effort to bring you that, but do you all see it anyway? Okay. So I'm giving you a few, uh, I'm giving you a few verses here to sum this up, what we had in verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 says, For our light affliction, which is but a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly, exceeding an eternal weight of glory, which is forever. It's hard to think about eternal things in the culture we're living in. Everything happens so fast. There was a time when, I guess it was in the 1800s, if you 
received the letter, it was a big deal. And you cherished that letter. And you would read it to your neighbors. I mean, because that's the only news that you had maybe in a month. But today, it's coming at, at us like a fire hose. It, I don't know about you, but the mail that I get, and the things that are on the emails, the snail mail emails, then they're calling you on the phone. Is there anybody here that has not been badgered about contributing to some politician? I removed 28 calls on my cell phone and every one of them were asking for money. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 36. We just read that, but it's worth reading again. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. You know, if you don't have confidence in God's Word, if you don't have confidence in the systematic theology that you have learned, if you don't have confidence that the Holy Spirit is empowering you to be able to do everything that God requires of you, if you lose that, you've lost everything. And the way that you keep that confidence strong is to keep on learning. Keep on growing. And see, confidence is the antithesis of doubt. And most people today won't hardly ever make a dogmatic statement because they're not sure about anything because they don't have confidence. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Confidence stokes endurance. And then we have Hebrews 11.6. And without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You see how reward is a thread that goes all throughout the Bible. Okay, here's Romans 8, 19. For the ancient's longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now you can already see I put a couple of things in parentheses here. The sons are huios, H-U-I-O-S in the Greek, and this would be mature son. And so if you're wondering when this revealing is going to take place, I already have it for you at the end of this, at the second advent. Now the thing that's a bit unusual, it's not talking about a person, it's talking about the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. We call this personification. So creation is being personified as if they are a person. Now, the I have underlined here anxious longing of the creation. Ancient, anxious longing is apa aradokia. Apa Paradokia. That's A P O K A R A D O K I A. And it's a verb, it's a present mental indicative. A verb, it's just pre, uh, the P means present tense. Creation keeps on anxiously, anxiously longing. <laughs> and that word means to wait eagerly. This word is used seven times in the Bible and it refers to the rapture every time. It's only used seven times in the Bible and every time it's used, its subject is Jesus Christ's return. Here are the, the verses. Romans eight nineteen, where we are. Romans eight twenty three. Romans eight twenty five. Notice how many are in chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Galatians 5 5, Philippians 3 20, and Hebrews 9 28. If you write these down, just don't write them down. When you get home, if you want to have a little 
shot of encouragement. Go to each one of these verses and see what it says. Every one of them about Christ's return. Now these aren't the only verses that have Christ returning. These are the ones that use this particular word. So we're looking at creation here in our verse now. For the anxious longing of the creation. What is it talking about here in the creation? It's talking about nature inanimate and animate. And is personified as waiting eagerly for that time. Now something that is inanimate would be like a rock. It doesn't move. It doesn't do anything. It's inanimate. Inanimate means life. It means to be moving. So it's talking about all creation here. Now this isn't the only time the Bible personifies nature. It speaks of rivers that clap their hands and mountains that sing together for joy. The first one is in Psalm 98, 8. And the second one is in Isaiah 55, 12 through 13. Let's go to those. I, 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 I thought, well, I better check these out to make sure that's correct. So let's go to Psalms first. Psalm 98. By the way, how many verses are in the psalm? I mean, how many chapters? Hmm? 150. Okay, Psalm 98, 8. Psalm 98, 8. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. Now let's turn to Isaiah 55, verse 12. Isaiah 55 and verse 12. Let's just for fun start with verse 6. We're going to start with verse 6 and go well let's just go to 13. Isaiah 55 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. The wicked is referring to overt sins and the unrighteous is referring to hidden sins. See, they're his thoughts. He's thinking. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So if you think you're smarter than the Lord, you're, you have a problem. Verse 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now these two verses are important, especially when God proclaims something in his word and you find it hard to believe. He doesn't think like we do. He is as high in his thoughts above us as the heavens are to the earth. Verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, they will, well, without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and the bread to the eater. I got to stop here for just a second. I got two inches of rain about, when was that? A week ago? Or it wasn't that far. Anyway, and I had another spot of rain about three weeks before that. And every time I get rain like that, it's like everything just comes alive. I've got a dead grass out there and everything's kind of leaning over and all. And that rain, it just perks up and looks like spring. I just thought I'd throw that in. Verse 11. 
So shall my word be with those which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. Remember that. When you t give the gospel to someone or you're talking about the Lord, you're talking about the Bible, and they completely dismiss it and they don't want to hear it, just remember it has done what it was supposed to. Then it goes on. Uh, I'll just start from the beginning on this one. So shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Now we get to 12. This is the one we were going to. For you will go out with joy. This is, by the way, referring to in the millennium. You will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of, of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And, in the, and it will be a memorial to the Lord. For an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. And we're right about to get into a curse on the land. And one reason I'm showing this is that curse isn't permanent because in the millennium, what was cursed is no longer cursed. And it's describing how the mountains shout with joy. And the thorn bush will be replaced with a cypress. Instead of nettle, There'll be a myrtle and so forth. Anyway, that's what that was about. And now, if you look up here on the screen, right here, you're going to see this about the curse. Okay? Again, this is our, our verse. Romans 8, 19. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. That's going to happen at the second advent. Now, the land came under a curse when Adam fell, and we now know that it will remain under what we call, we could call it undeserved suffering. The land is cursed. It didn't deserve it. It was part of God's plan. And it's going to last till the second advent. In the millennium, the earth will revert back to a perfect environment like Adam had in the garden. And we will be there. I hope that I can experience a garden then because my gardens as of late see that. I think everybody does, doesn't it? Yet still after a thousand years a perfect environment and a perfect ruler, one third of the population of the earth will again revolt against God. So when we leave this earth vertically when Jesus Christ comes back to get us, then the tribulation takes place. And at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ is going to return again. That's called the second advent. The first was when he came here and was born as a man. And it's at that time that the entire structure of the earth is going to be drastically changed for the good. Now, just think how great it is. Jesus Christ is going to have perfect government. It's the only time that this has ever happened. We've never, no country anywhere at any time has even gotten close to a perfect government. But when Christ comes back, we will have perfect government. And who is going to be administrating this perfect government? Raise your hand. <laughs> we are. We're in preparation for that and have perfect environment, perfect everything. But even after that, a third of the people on earth are going to revolt against God. It's called the Gog Revolution. And of course, Jesus Christ is going to dispense with that post-haste. But this demonstrates that the curse on the land is not responsible for man's rejection and rebellion against God. A lot of people think, oh, well, the only reason that we can't be better people is because we have such a poor environment. Well, this is going to be perfect environment. You know that the, the 
second advent is going to begin with nothing but believers. Y'all all know that, don't you? That's going to be phenomenal in itself. Jesus Christ is going to be ruling the world. And after a thousand years, there's going. To, the Bible says that it's, they're like the numbers are the sand of the sea that are going to have, uh, Satan is going to be temporarily loosed from the pit and he's going to ramrod this revolution and of course it's going to end uh, right away. But that's kind of, it's showing you how depraved man is. So creation was subjected to futility as a part of God's curse on sin. So we see this in our next two verses here, Romans chapter 8, verse 20 through 21. This is what we I've been talking about here. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him, and that would be God the Father, who subjected it in hope, in hope really, would fit better if it was on the other side of that 21, but that's where it is. Now, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him, God the Father, who subjected it to that, in hope that the creation itself will also be free from its slavery to corruption. And I have here under the slavery to corruption, the change of nature in the millennium, and we have these verses here, are tremendous verses. So, creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. To really understand this, we really need to go to, first of all, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Y'all remember Genesis, don't you? What did we spend seven years on it? Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 17. Genesis 3, 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. i just say one thing about this verse. Look what the first thing God said to Adam wasn't about eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, which God told him, Don't do. The first thing he says, Because you have listened to the Voice of your wife. Now, I just said last Sunday, guys, we need to listen more to our wives. But this is not in that context. This means she was wearing pants. She was, was controlling the show and not Adam. And God created Eve to help Adam, not to intimidate him or take control. Just thought I'd throw that in. Okay. Now, the next part of this verse is what we're talking about. He says, Curse is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall not eat the plants of the field. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground because of from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Wow. Can you imagine? I was thinking about this when I was writing this. How would you like to live in the Garden of Eden? You could run around naked and it, no, it was okay. Nothing. God created us, and there was only Adam and his wife. But I was thinking about how easy it would be to grow some. You could be taking some seeds out there to plant. You drop one on the way. By the time you come back, it's this tall. I mean, can you imagine what that dirt must have been like? 
Can you imagine what the fruit tasted like? And they went from that to black gumbo. That's what I have at my house. Thistles, thorns. And it's still that way. So when he says again, for the creation was subjected to futility, he's talking about because it was cursed by God because of what Adam did. And we're not just talking about the, the plants and the uh, trees. and We're talking about everything. Was, it was and still is under a curse. The word for futility here, it says that for creation was subject to futility. Here's the Greek word for futility. It's called mataiotes. M-A-T-A-I-O-T-E-S. Some of you have heard that before because if you get to where you are backsliding, if you get to a point to where you're not consistently taking in the word, then the doctrine that you were taking in it has to be replaced with something else. It's like a vacuum and it will suck in all kinds of human good and uh, lies. So, mataotes means a state of being without use or value, emptiness, futility, purposelessness. That's what it did. Here's one, one, one uh, paragraph on that. The curse on creation is still felt by us today. If you have a garden, no one needs to tell you anything about the curse of the land. Preparing the soil is probably the hardest part. It has become harder in our time because the soil has lost its nutrients because it never is allowed to go fallow for a time, which God calls for in the Bible for the Jews. And that's not done. Artificial fertilizers are used that can't compare with nature's fertilizers. Well, when I first <coughs> moved to our house out in the country here, my neighbor had about 40 cows and he had a manure spreader. Y'all probably seen manure spreader. Have y'all ever used one? I know you have. Well, it works, but it is very stinky. But anyway, my point is the artificial per fertilizers can't compare it to the natural ones. Planting has its problem too. Most seeds are hybrids or contain pesticides. All kinds of fertilizers are sprayed on plants that are harmful to food, no, harmful to animals, bees, birds, and people. Most of the food we buy is picked too early and additives are sprayed on it to make it last longer or taste better, and sometimes coloring or wax is sprayed on it to make it look better. So when you get, if you go into the produce area in a grocery store, and you pick up the best that they have, and you taste it, if let me put it this way, if Adam would have tasted it, he'd spit it out. And even if you get organic, my point is, that the curse is still going and it's a shame because man has just made it worse. Take the homegrown tomato and compare it to a tomato from a grocery store. Need I say more? Just think about how wonderful the food tasted that Adam and Eve ate in the Garden of Eden before the curse. Now I'm going to go up here. I'm going to close on these three verses right here. For creation was subjected to futility because it was cursed. Not of its own will, but because of him, God, who subjected it. He purposely did that. Now, at this point, in hope that creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption. Not only we are slaves to corruption, so is the creation. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 11, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 6. It 
6 through 9. This is verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together. The little boy will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze. I want to see a bear graze out of here. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. Verse 8. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, that's, that's talking about after the curse is gone at the second advent. This is talking about the millennium. Now turn to Isaiah 35, 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 35, starting with verse 1 through 7. Here we go. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like a crocus. Arabah is the wilderness. The crocus is, I think, of the uh, cactus. It's a beautiful yellow flower for a cactus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and the strengthen and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not, behold your God will come with Vengeance, the recompense of God will come. Look up at this. But he will save you. Underline that. That's one reason I came here. This is talking about when Jesus Christ comes back to earth, there's going to be hell to pay. There's going to be, as this says, his vengeance poured out. But we, he will save you. He's talking about us here. Verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah and the scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the hump of the jackals its resting place Grass becomes reeds and rushes. So what we're talking about is just a sample. I could go to, well, we got one more. It's in Isaiah. Let's go there. It's Isaiah 6, 65, 25. Just go back, uh, go further along here. Isaiah 65. You didn't know that Isaiah was that long, did you? Isaiah 65, then go to verse 25. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food good. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. That's what I think the serpent. They shall do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So the curse is off. I'm showing you what it's going to be. And the last thing I want to say, just have a minute left, but this is so important to try to pull some of this together. We have in the world today probably more desperate people than have been in the world in a long time. We have so many people committing suicide 
And one reason that they do it is because they think that there is no hope. They think that this is go, going to go on and on. So why live? Why even want to be part of this? Because they don't have hope. And the hope is for us a reality. We know that this wickedness and this evil and all the corruption of this earth is going to end and end for good. And this is what we're reading here in Isaiah. And in the Psalms, it's all over the Old Testament about what the second advent, advent is going to be like. And it means there's not going to be all that that we see now. Now, I said that there's going to be a revolution at the end. But God isn't going to put up with all the nonsense that we're putting up with today. So they're going to hate him because he's going to make them mine. And if they commit a crime, and it's a capital crime, they're going to be executed. It's going to, not going to be ten years later. It's going to be fair and just government. People don't know that this is going to happen. Even most believers don't even know that. When you think of dispensations, it's all in order that fits into place. There's a lot of people that don't believe in dispensations. It's just a mismatch or hit or, hit or miss. And so it's important for us to tell other people that there's a curse on the earth. And there's a curse that man is going to go through until Christ returns and it all is going to be set right. And the evil and the corruption and the wickedness and all these things are going to be a thing of the past. That gives them hope, a reason to live. On past time, we'll pick this up, up next time. Let's go. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your perfect plan. It is so wonderful, we can't even hardly wrap our mind around it. And it, it will surely come to pass. So when we are thinking about our problems and our woes, and when we face testing, especially undeserved suffering, help us to realize that this is for a purpose. We're in training so that when we are past the tribulation, and you come back at the second advent, we will be ready to minister your perfect plan, your perfect government. That gives us hope. It should give everyone hope. And we pray that you will help us to formulate what to say to these people in our own words, in our own way, because they desperately need help and hope. They desperately need to find something that is sure and that they can be motivated, that they'll know that they will see it too if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.